We present June Whitfield as Miss Marple in Agatha Christie's The Mirror Cracked from Side to Side. Here we are, then. I hope we've been having a nice snooze. I have been knitting, and I have dropped a stitch. Oh, dearie, dearie me. Well, we'll soon put that right, won't we? You will. My eyesight is not good enough. Oh, I'm sure we can do that in a jiffy. Let's have a look at it. Why does she have to treat me as if I were a mentally retarded child? I'm old and short-sighted, and I've had a bad attack of bronchitis. But I am still compass mentis, thank God. There we are, dear. That's done. Thank you. Now, I'm just going to put on my hat and coat before I go out for a little toddle. It's all Dr. Haydock's fault for insisting that I shouldn't go on sleeping alone in the house. And it was very good of Raymond to get someone in, if only it didn't have to be Miss Knight. Perhaps if I can think of enough things for her to do while she's having her little toddle, I might manage to slip out without her noticing. Here we are, then. Anything I can get you while I'm out, dear? Well, you might go into Longdon's and see if the curtains are ready. And perhaps another skein of this blue wool from Mrs. Wisley. Ah, and a box of black currant lozenges from the chemist's. Oh, and change my book at the library, but don't let them give you anything that isn't on my list. This last one was quite dreadful. Oh, dearie, dearie me. String sweet passion. And I was sure you'd love it. But there's no accounting for taste. And if it isn't too far for you, perhaps you wouldn't mind going to Hallett's to see if they have one of those up-and-down egg whisks, not the -the turn-the-handle kind. I hope that won't be too much for you. Don't give it a thought. Now, you'll be a good little girl while I'm gone, won't you? Once I was certain that she was out of sight, I slipped out of the side door, took the path through the vicarage garden, and went over the little bridge that led to the development. Aubrey Close, Langland Close... Why do they have to call them that? My Uncle Edwin lived in a real close, but he was a canon of... Oh, oh, dear. Are you all right? I hope you haven't hurt yourself. How very stupid of me not looking where I was going. There we are. No bones broken. I expect you're feeling a bit shaken. Yes, yes, I am rather. You'd better come into the house and have a sit down. I'll make you a cup of tea. Oh, no, no, thank you. No sugar. Nonsense. You must have sugar. It's wonderful for shock. I know all about it. I was abroad with ambulances during the war. Four lumps. Get that down you and you'll be as right as rain. You're very kind. Oh, I love helping people. Regular ministering angel, that's me. (laughs) Here's my husband home. Arthur, we've got a visitor. What did you say, Heather? Oh, uh, good afternoon. This poor lady fell down right outside our gate. Your wife is very kind, Mr... Uh, Badcock's the name. Were you on your way anywhere in particular? Uh, No, I was just taking a walk. I live in the house by the vicarage. My name is Marple. uh... Well, I never... You're the lady who does all the murders. Oh, Heather, Miss Marple Well, not actually do the murders. It was you who solved the business up at Gossington Hall, wasn't it? The body on the library carpet. Well, the murder wasn't actually... And have you heard who's coming to live there now? No, I knew that the house was on the market. Marina Gregg. The film actress. She and her husband, Jason Rudd. He's a producer, or something like that. Of course, she hasn't done many pictures lately. Well, she was ill for a long time. Hmm. But there's never been anyone quite like her. Did you see Mary of Scotland? Well, I can't... And that that other one, what was it called? Carmen something? Carmenella. I've always been a terrific fan of hers. The great thrill of my life was when there was a big show in aid of the St John Ambulance in Bermuda and Marina Gregg came to open it. (laughs) 
<laughs> I was mad with excitement. And then on the very day, I went down with a temperature and the doctor said I couldn't go. Oh. But I wasn't going to be beaten. So I got up and put a lot of makeup on my face and went along. And I was introduced to her. And she talked to me for quite three minutes and gave me her autograph. I've never forgotten that day. Oh, I, I hope that there were no, no unfortunate after effects. Oh, none at all. What I say is if you want a thing, you've got to take risks. But I'm neglecting you, Miss Marple. Would you like another cup of tea? No. Thank you. You've been very kind, but I really must be going. I wonder whether you would be so good as to ring Inch for me. Inch? Oh, no. He's not Inch anymore. He's called Roberts, I think. But it's still called Inch's taxi service, I believe. Uh, uh, right you are, Miss Marple. And uh, you'd like him to take you back home? No. I think that there's just time for me to pay a quick call on Mrs Bantry. Ah, uh, the lady that used to own Gossington Hall. Uh, I'll see to it straight away. I really don't care what they do with the place. I never felt the same about it after we found that poor girl on the hearth rug. I couldn't bear to live there now, Jane. The lodge is good enough for me. And is it true about Marina Gregg? Oh, yes. It's quite definite. They've started moving in already. How very lovely she was. I shall never forget those early films of hers. They were terribly sentimental, but I <laughs> did enjoy them so. <laughs> That was a long time ago, Dolly. Yes, she must be... What do you think? Forty-five? Nearer fifty, I should think. She hasn't been in a film for a long time. She had that bad, nervous breakdown after one of her divorces. Such a lot of husbands they all have. It really must be quite tiring. I met her when I was in California. Oh, what was she like? Charming. So natural and unspoiled... But I suppose that's what's expected of them. You learn how to do it. She's had four husbands, hasn't she? At least. There was an early one that didn't count before she went to Hollywood. Then there was Robert Truscott, I think. Oh, I can't remember them all. <laughs> there was Isidore Wright, the novelist. They had a baby, I think. She'd always wanted a baby. But something went wrong, she had a breakdown and began to take drugs. And now she's married again. Yes. Jason Rudd. They're going to do a film together about Elizabeth of Austria, I believe. Anyway, you'll have a chance to see her for yourself. She's throwing the hall open to the public for a fate in aid of the St. John Ambulance Corps. Oh, I don't think that's my kind of thing at all. And I'm sure Miss Knight would never permit it. <laughs> I suppose Marina Gregg is having a lot done to the house. So I've heard. <laughs> no expense spared. They've sent me an invitation to go round there the day before the fete, a kind of private view. Ooh. I can't wait to see what they've done to the place. I really can't get over it, Mrs. Bantry. It's such an amazing coincidence. <laughs> Meeting you like that in San Francisco and then... Two years later, we come to England and buy your house. I, I hope you don't feel we're intruders. Your coming here is the most exciting thing that's ever happened to the place. But I'm forgetting you don't know my husband, do you? Jason, this is Mrs Bantry. How do you do? A husband is always an afterthought. But let me say with my wife that we're very glad to welcome you here. I hope you don't feel it ought to be the other way around. You know, you really must get it out of your heads that I'm being driven from my old home. I've been congratulating myself ever since I sold it. And I've had a perfectly splendid time travelling abroad and going to see my daughters and grandchildren. You have grandchildren? Nine to date. It's great fun being a grandmother. You don't have any of the worry of parental responsibility. You can spoil them in the most abandoned way. My youngest daughter's little oh, girl. Won't you have a cup of tea, Mrs. Bantry? Oh, uh, thank you. And uh, can I offer you a, a hot scone or a cake? You see, we've quite taken to your English afternoon tea. It reminds me of my childhood. Thank you. I would love a scone. Well, here you are. I do so hope you enjoy it here. Do you expect to have this house for long? I want to stay here forever. Oh, I, I don't mean that I shan't have to go away a lot... But this will be my home. 
I shall always be able to come here. That's what's so wonderful, <laughs> to have found a home at last. Of course, the whole of St. Mary Mead descended on Gossington Hall for the open day, eager to see for themselves what the film people had done to the place. The swimming pool in particular caused great satisfaction. It was large, it was blue, and there was much speculation about the wicked orgies that would doubtless take place in and around it. Councillor Mrs. Philpott. Inside the house, on the second floor, a room had been set aside for special guests, and Marina Gregg stood at the top of the staircase to receive them, while her Italian butler stood in as Major Domo. The Reverend and Mrs. Clement. And there was one person who was certainly not going to let slip an opportunity to renew an old acquaintance. Mr. and Mrs. Babcock. I'm sure you don't remember me, Miss Gregg. Well, how could you, with all the people you meet? And anyway, it was years ago, in Bermuda. I was there with our ambulance units. How oh, very interesting. I was only a girl at the time, and I was such a fan of yours. And when I realised there was a chance of actually meeting you in the flesh... It's really very kind of you. It was the most important thing that had ever happened to me. I was mad with excitement. And on Two of the guests were complete you. strangers to St Mary Mead. Ardwick Fenn and Lola Brewster had come all the way from Hollywood. Well, I must say, Marina certainly knows how to do things in style. So gracious and charming and condescending. Yeah, I guess she's getting into training for playing Elizabeth of Austria. She's certainly giving the locals her money's worth. I wish that woman who's talking to her would stop telling her her life story. <laughs> oh, I need a drink. Hey, what's come over Marina all of a sudden? Hmm? She looks like she's seen a ghost. I've never forgotten how wonderful you were that day. It was a hundred times worth it. Oh, what a, a nice little story, Mrs. Badcock. Now, let me get you a drink, Mrs. Badcock. What would you like? Well, usually I only have a lemonade or a tomato juice. Oh, this is a festive occasion. You must have a daiquiri cocktail. It's oh. Marina's favourite. What about you, darling? Oh, I've had far too many... I but why not? As you say, it's a festive occasion. Here's your breakfast tray, dear. Oh, I see we've drawn our curtains back already. I wake early. You probably will when you're my age. Mrs Bantry rang up about half an hour ago. She wanted to speak to you, but I said she'd better try again after you'd had your breakfast. When my friends ring up, I prefer to be told. I'm sorry, I'm sure, but it seemed very inconsiderate. When you've had your nice tea and your boiled egg and your toast, then you can speak to her. <sighs> oh, that'll be cherry. Why does she have to slam the door when she comes in? It's like the way she always starts singing when she turns the vacuum on. Why can't she be more respectful? It would never enter Cherry's head that she would have to be respectful. Why should she? Come in, Cherry. And now, Miss Knight, I'd like you to ring up Mrs Bantry and find out what she wanted. I'm sure it must be something important. Very well, Miss Marple. Morning. Morning. Good morning, Miss Marple. Evening. I thought I'd come up straight away to see if you'd heard the news. What news, Cherry? About what happened at the big do at Gossington Hall yesterday. Well, what did happen? Somebody died in the middle of it all. Oh, and Mrs Badcock lives round the corner from us. I don't suppose you know her. Oh, but I do know her. She helped me up when I had my fall the other day. She was very kind. And some people would call it interfering. Anyway, she up and died just like that. But what did she die of? Search me. As far as I heard, she had a glass of something and about five minutes later she was took bad and died before you could snap your fingers. How very shocking. Did she suffer from heart trouble? Sound as a bell, they say. But of course you never know, do you? Anyway, I can tell you this. They've not sent her home. What do you mean, not sent her home? The body. The doctor said there'd have to be a post-mortem. Is her husband terribly upset? Looks as white as a sheet. Never saw a man so badly hit. To look at, that is to say. 
Was he so very devoted to her? He did what she told him and gave her her own way, but that doesn't always mean you're devoted, does it? No. It may mean you haven't got the courage to stick up for yourself. Mrs Bantry's gone out. She didn't tell anybody where she was going. I can guess where she's going. She's coming here. I'm getting up. It all happened so quickly. This woman, whatever her name was... Heather Badcock. She arrives full of life and spirit, and about a quarter of an hour later, she sits down on a chair, says she doesn't feel very well, gasps a bit, and dies. I practically saw it happen. Splendid. I, I mean, well, you know what I mean. So you can tell me exactly what happened. Well... They were having a reception upstairs for special guests. Like you? Well, yes, if you put it like that. And this Badcock woman was there because of the St John ambulance, I suppose. Anyway, she and her husband were introduced to Marina Gregg. And then she, uh, Mrs Badcock launched out on some long rigmarole about how she met Marina long ago... She wasn't very tactful about it. Kept on saying what a long time ago it was. I'm sure that film actresses don't really like being reminded of their age. <laughs> Still, she wouldn't think of that, I suppose. No, I don't imagine she was the sort of woman who would. But go on. Well, the odd thing was that Marina didn't do her stuff. You mean she was annoyed? Oh, no, not that. As a matter of fact, I am not at all sure she heard a word the silly woman was saying. She was staring over her shoulder at the wall opposite, staring with... I don't know how to describe it. Oh, do try, Dolly. I think perhaps that it might be important. She had a kind of frozen look, as though she'd seen something that... As though she'd seen what? Do you remember Tennyson's The Lady of Shalott? The mirror cracked from side to side. The curse has come upon me, cried the Lady of Shalott. Well, that's what she looked like. She had a frozen look, and she was looking over Mrs. Badcock's shoulder at the wall. What was on the wall? Picture. A copy of a Bellini Madonna and Child. I can't see that a picture could have that effect on her. Especially as she must see it every day. There were still people coming up the stairs, I suppose? Yes, there were. You mean she might have been looking at one of them? Well, it is possible, isn't it? Who were they, do you remember? Hmm. Now, let me see. She'd already met the mayor and the vicar. There was a rather arty-looking girl taking photographs of people having their hands shaken by Marina. There was Dr Sanford and his wife. There were two people I didn't know at all. A dark, rather forceful-looking man and a woman who might have been an actress. A bit overblown and the minky kind. And then there were the Grices from Lower Farm. Oh, apart from the strangers, it doesn't sound very promising. What happened next? I think Jason Rudd must have nudged her or something. Because all of a sudden, Marina seemed to pull herself together and smiled at Mrs. Badcock and began to say all the usual things. And then? Jason Rudd gave them drinks. What kind of drinks? Daiquiris, I think. I didn't see what happened after that. Why ever not? Oh, I had to take a gaggle of tiresome women round the rest of the house. Oh. The next thing I knew was when a secretary woman came rushing along and said someone had been taken ill. And now there's to be an inquest. And a post-mortem. I suppose the husband's the most likely suspect. It generally is. Did you meet him? Yes, but only for a short time. Did he look as though he'd like to poison her? Oh, oh really, Dolly? I'll bet you the police will be round on his doorstep like a shot. I imagine the findings of the inquest must have come as a bit of a shock, Mr. Badcock. Uh, I can't understand it. It's just incredible. 
What is this stuff she's supposed to have taken? By ethyl? Uh, uh, there's an easier name for it. It's sold under the trade name of Carmo. Ever come across it? I can't say that I have, Inspector. It's more commonly used in America than here. Uh, Carmo is a, a happy drug, a tranquilizer, prescribed for people who are under stress or suffering from insomnia. <sighs> If you stick to the prescribed dose, it's quite safe, but it can be dangerous if you exceed the recommended amount. Your wife had six times more than the normal dose. But, but Heather would never have taken a thing like that. She was one of the most cheerful women you can imagine. It must have been a mistake of some kind. It's a very difficult mistake to imagine. What did she have to eat or drink while she was at Gossington Hall? Well, uh, we had a cup of tea and a bun in the marquee on the lawn. It was a terrible scrum in there. But then this young lady came and said Miss Gregg would be pleased to see my wife. And of course, Heather was delighted. She'd been talking of nothing else for days. And so you went to meet Miss Gregg? Heather told her the story of how they'd met in the West Indies years ago. Everything seemed as right as rain. And then Mr Rudd gave Heather a cocktail, a, a, a daiquiri, he said it was, and he brought one for Miss Gregg as well. And what did you have? Oh, I, I had a small sherry. And you three stood drinking together? Well, uh, no, not exactly. There were more people coming up the stairs. Uh, it, an American couple, I, I think. So we sort of moved on a bit. And your wife drank her daiquiri then? No, she didn't. Uh, a woman from the St John Ambulance came up and she put her cocktail down on one of the tables. So when did she drink it? Uh, the room was getting rather crowded by then and uh, somebody jogged Heather's elbow and the drink got spilt. Her glass got spilled. Mm, it uh, went down her dress, and I, I think it went over Miss Gregg's dress, too. <sighs> Miss Gregg couldn't have been nicer. She gave Heather her handkerchief to wipe her dress, and she passed over the drink she was holding and said, Have this one. I haven't touched it yet. Sh she handed your wife her own drink. Mm. You're quite sure of that? Uh, oh, yes. Heather wouldn't take it at first, but Miss Gregg laughed and said... I've had far too many already. And then? Uh, Heather turned away and drank it rather quickly. Uh, and then we walked a little way along the corridor, looking at the pictures. I met an old pal of mine, Councillor Grigson, and we had a bit of a chat. I happened to look round and saw that Heather was sitting in a chair, looking rather odd. Her head was rolling a little, and I asked her what was the matter, and... She gave a kind of gasp, and her head fell forward. She was dead. I couldn't believe it. Dermot Craddock, how are you, my dear boy? Aunt Jane. <laughs> Though you're hardly a boy now. What are you? A chief inspector, or the new thing they call a commander? <laughs> Just a chief inspector, Aunt Jane. <laughs> I suppose I need not ask what you're doing down here. But I didn't expect our little local murder to be worthy of the attention of Scotland Yard. And the Chief Constable is not so sure it really is a little local murder. He reckons that if someone simply wanted to get rid of Heather Badcock, then a fate at Gossington Hall was a rather odd occasion to choose. Why run the risk of someone seeing you slip a deadly dose of a drug into a cocktail? Exactly. So, as soon as I got down here, I came straight round to headquarters. Meaning me? I'm afraid I'm not very much in touch with things nowadays. I don't get out very often. You get out enough to fall down on the doorstep of a woman who gets herself murdered ten days later? I don't know where you learn these things. You should know. You told me yourself that in a village everybody knows everything. <laughs> and just off the record, did you see a look in her husband's eye that reminded you of a Harry Simpson or Davy Jones or somebody you'd known years ago who pushed his wife off a precipice? No, mm. I did not. And I'm sure Mr Badcock would never do anything of the kind. At least, I'm nearly sure. But human nature being what it is... Exactly. So, 
Where do you think I should start? Well, not with Mr. Badcock. If I were you, I would have a word with Marina Gregg. Oh, no, signore. It is not possible. Miss Marina Gregg will see nobody. Now, look here, Mr... My name is Giuseppe. I'm the butler. Yeah, look, Giuseppe. Surely she must realise that this is a case of suspected murder. <laughs> but she's sick, signore. Her own physician says she must see no one. He has written a certificate. Would you like to see it? Uh, no, 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 don't bother. Does she always have her own doctor in attendance? Always. Dr. Gilchrist has looked after her for many years. I see. Then could I see Mr. Rudd? I'm sorry, he's at the studios. But very soon he will be coming back. I see. In the meantime, perhaps I could have a word with this Dr. Gilchrist? <laughs> but certainly, signore. I will take you to him. If you were to question Marina now, she'd be in a state of hysteria within minutes. I can't permit that. And how long is this state of affairs likely to continue? Hmm. If you want my opinion, a human one, not a medical opinion, any time within the next 48 hours and she'll be not only willing but asking to see you. Marina's got one of those temperaments that swing to and fro all the time. You must understand, Chief Inspector, that the movie actor's life is one of continuous strain. And the more successful you are, the greater the strain. Is that why she takes this stuff calmo? I, I presume she does take it. And lives on it pretty well. They all do. Ella, all of them. There's a bottle of it in most of the bathroom cupboards. I suppose that it was a considerable shock for her. A, a sudden death occurring in the middle of a party like that. Or, or might it be something more? Uh, well... You can't tell, of course, how people are going to react. What exactly do you mean by that, Doctor? I must ask you to keep what I'm going to tell you confidential. Not from your colleagues, of course, but from the outer world. Particularly the people in the house here. I can't bind myself, but, but in general terms, yes, I agree. After this thing happened, she broke down completely. I gave her a sedative and stayed there beside her, holding her hand. Just before she went off into unconsciousness, she said, It was meant for me. And afterwards, the following day? She never alluded to it. When I raised the point, she told me I must have imagined it. But do you think she meant it? I'm certain of it. She definitely believed the poison was meant for her. I appreciate what you've told me. And I realize your motive, if... What Marina Gregg told you is true, then her life is still in danger. That is the whole point. Have you any idea what her reason for believing it was? No. Uh, just one more thing, Doctor. Do you know if she has mentioned this to her husband? I'm sure she hasn't. That is why, when you speak to him, I ask that you keep what I've told you confidential. Can I offer you a drink, Inspector? Uh, not just now, thank you. <laughs> Not the house to take a drink in, is that what you're thinking? <laughs> As a matter of fact, it wasn't what I was thinking. Oh, well, please sit down. Uh, thank you. Well, <clears throat> what do you want to know? What can I tell you? Well, I've just been talking to Dr Gilchrist. He informs me that your wife is not yet strong enough to be asked questions. I doubt if there is anything my wife could tell you that you could not learn equally from me. Do you have any previous acquaintance with the dead woman, Heather Badcock? None whatever. But she claimed to have known your wife. Oh, yes. Some 12 or, or 13 years ago in Bermuda. As soon as Mrs. Badcock was introduced to Marina, she burst into a long rigmarole of how, although she was suffering from uh, flu at the time, she'd managed to go along and get my wife's autograph. Now, I've been told that your wife looked rather distressed during the time that Heather Badcock was speaking to her. Was that the case? Very possibly. Marina is not particularly strong. Toward the end of a long day, she is inclined to flag. I do remember that she was a little slow in making her reply to Mrs. Badcock. I, I think I nudged her slightly on the elbow. And do you think that something had diverted her attention? C could she have noticed an unwelcome guest? Uh, not that I know of. As I say, it was probably just tiredness. Has it occurred to you, Mr. Rudd, that the poisoning of Heather Badcock may have been entirely accidental? That the intended victim was your wife? 
Yes, it has occurred to me. In fact, I've been sure of it all along. But you said nothing to that effect at the inquest. Why not? I didn't want my wife to think she had narrowly escaped dying by poison. I'm not sure that I entirely understand your reason for keeping silent. Well, perhaps it is a little difficult to appreciate. Marina is incapable of taking a rational, prudent view of life. In her previous marriages, she expected, like a child reading a fairy story, to live happy ever afterwards. And she didn't. There are some women who can take the failure of a marriage fairly lightly, but Marina wasn't capable of that. She became obsessed with the notion that nothing would ever go right for us. She was wildly anxious to have children, and no children came. A celebrated physician advised her to adopt a child. He thought that that might diminish the tensions that prevented her conceiving... <laughs> Marina adopted no less than three children. But for her, it was never the real thing. Now, you can imagine her joy when 11 years ago she found that she was going to have a child. She was in good health and there was good reason for everything to go well. As you may or may not know, the child was born mentally deficient and imbecile. Marina couldn't cope with it. She had a complete breakdown and was ill for years. And it was then that she met you. Mm -hmm. I managed to get her to take an interest in life again, but the real problem was getting her back into pictures. It was quite a battle, but we managed it, and as you know, shooting has already started. Everything was going well until... until that woman had to die. Here. I couldn't risk Marina getting to know an attempt had been made on her life. It would have precipitated another collapse. Do you understand now? Oh, yeah, I, I see your point of view. But isn't there something you're forgetting? Hmm? If the poison really was meant for your wife, then the killer will try again. Well, naturally, I've considered that. But now that I've been forewarned, I can take precautions for her safety. And you're sure that she doesn't suspect the poison was meant for her? Such an idea would never occur to her. So, <clears throat> whom do you suggest? I can't tell you. Do you mean you can't or you won't? <laughs> can't. It seems impossible that anyone would dislike her enough to kill her. But surely you can't get where she has in the film business without making enemies. Oh, yeah. There's plenty of enmity and jealousy in our world. But to do a thing like that... But there must be something beyond petty dislike and envy. Is there anyone your wife has injured in the past? Well, honestly, I don't think so. And I may say I've given the matter a, a good deal of thought. A love affair somewhere? Uh, I suppose Marina has occasionally treated men badly, but... I can think of nothing to cause lasting ill will. Can you think of any woman who might have a lasting grudge against her? Nobody offhand. But you can never tell with women. Who would benefit financially by your wife's death? Uh, myself, of course. And, and looking at it from a different angle, the actress who might replace her in the film. There's one more thing I'd like you to do for me. Well... I need a list of every single person who was in the room and on the stairs at the time of the murder. Oh, you would do far better to consult my secretary, Ella Zielinski, about that. She will have a note of all the people who were invited, and, and she has a most accurate memory. That's the best I can do, I'm afraid. I can't guarantee that all the local people invited actually turned up. Mm -hmm. A very efficient piece of work. What does your job involve, exactly? Are you a kind of liaison officer between the studios and Gossington Hall? No, I've nothing to do with the studios, thank God. My job is to look after Miss Gregg's public and private engagements and to supervise the running of the house. You like the job? It's extremely well paid, and I find it reasonably interesting. I didn't bargain for murder, though. <laughs> you really are sure it's murder? <laughs> Six times the dose of diethyl, whatever, could hardly be called anything else. But couldn't it have been an accident? 
And how could such an accident have occurred? More easily than you'd imagine. What with all the bottles and powders and capsules these people carry about with them, and what with popping in a tranquilizer here and a pep pill somewhere else, don't you think it would be easy enough for the whole thing to get mixed up? I don't see how it could apply in this case. Well, I think it could. Suppose one of the guests wanted a sedative or a reviver and put too much in the glass. Then they put the glass down and go off somewhere and Mrs. What's-her-name comes along, thinks it's her glass and picks it up and drinks it. But we know that the glass that Mrs. Badcock drank out of was Marina Gregg's own glass. Or what she thought was her own glass. She'd pick up any glass that looked as though it was hers. I've seen her do it again and again. Is Miss Gregg a difficult person to work for? (coughs) I'm sorry. (coughs) Bless you. Uh, Blessing won't help. It's hay fever. (laughs) I'm not used to the country. (sighs) Marina's a great artist, and because of that, it's quite a privilege to work for her. Taken personally, of course, she's hell. What kind of hell? She's no kind of moderation. Everything is always terrifically exaggerated, and she changes her mind all the time. And there are an enormous lot of things that can never be mentioned because they upset her. Such as? Well, naturally, mental breakdown and anything to do with children. Children? In what way? Well, it upsets her to see children or to hear of people being happy with children. I guess you've heard about her own child. But you'd think that after all these years... It's an obsession with her. She broods on it. What does Mr Rudd feel about it? Oh, it wasn't his child. It was her previous husband, Isidore Wright. And where is he now? Married again and lives in Florida. Would you say that Marina Gregg made many enemies during her life? Mm, Not more than most. There are always rows over other women or other men or over contracts. She wasn't afraid of anyone? Marina? Why should she be? Well, just a thought. I can see I've got a lot to learn about the film business. Smiles all round, the happy faces of Marina's adopted children transported to a life of luxury in the Hollywood sunshine of a fabulous Beverly Hills villa. Well, I never. What on earth are you reading? Uh, It's called Movie News, I think. News from the stars... Hollywood scandals. Where on earth do you get this lot? From the hairdressers. Mrs Jameson was glad to get rid of them. But what are you reading them for? I'm trying to instruct myself in the moving picture world. Oh, fantastic lives they lead. Mm, Specialised lives. It reminds me very much of the things a hospital nurse friend of mine used to tell me. The same simplicity of outlook and all the gossip and the rumours and good-looking doctors causing any amount of havoc. I suppose it's Marina Gray coming to live at Gossington Hall set you off on all this. That and the sad event that happened there. It's a funny old business, isn't it? I mean, I don't see who could have murdered her except her husband. And he's such a weak type. Still, the worm will turn, as they say. Poor Mr Badcock. And people are saying he was upset and nervy at the fate that day. Before it happened. Is that Inspector friend of yours? I'll take the Hoover upstairs. Morning, Inspector. Good morning. Good morning, Aunt Jane. Good morning, Dermot. Mm. Doing your homework, I see. (laughs) Is all that bump giving you any ideas? Well, yes, there is one question I should like to ask. And what's that? What about the children? Children? There's only one, and he's in a sanatorium somewhere in America. Oh, no, no, that's not what I mean. I'm talking about the children in this article here. Hmm? Two boys and a girl adopted by Marina Gregg. One was a foreign refugee and one was an American child. I don't know about the other. I'd like to find out what happened to them. Yes, I, I did vaguely wonder about them myself. But how do you connect them with this business? Well, as far as I can find out, they're not living with her now, are they? I expect they were well provided for. So when she got tired of them, they were thrown out. Children feel things more than people ever imagine. The sense of hurt, of being rejected, of not belonging anymore. It's the sort of thing that might rankle. Yes, but but isn't it a bit far-fetched to think... Oh, I haven't got as far as that. I just wondered where they were now and how old they would be. Grown up, I should imagine. Well, there's no harm in checking up. 
But do you have any positive leads yourself? Miss Zielinski. Hmm? The secretary at Gossington Hall. Oh. She's given me a list of all the people who were in the house at the time of the murder. I've got Cornish checking through it now. And what about Marina's husband? I believe you went to see him. There's not much escapes you, is there? I'm not so sure about Jason Rudd. He says that Marina mustn't know that she was the intended victim, but I'm pretty sure she knows very well. And that she may have an idea who it was that did it. It could be that the motive behind the attack is something she doesn't want to come to her husband's ear. And what about the secretary woman? Is she in love with the husband, do you think? I should imagine so. What put that idea into your head? Well, it so often happens. I suppose it's a possible motive. But I'd still like to know more about those children. You've got quite a bee in your bonnet about them, haven't you? Mm. All right, I'll find out. I suppose it's perfectly possible one of them put in a surprise appearance at the fate. It would have been enough to make the mirror crack. I suppose it might. But I'd better see how Inspector Cornish is progressing with that list. I suppose it couldn't possibly have been the mayor. <laughs> Wishful thinking? <laughs> you could certainly call it that. Pompous, canting old hypocrite. <laughs> He's been knee-deep in graft for years. Quite tempting. But I think you'll have to banish that rosy picture from your mind, Frank. <sighs> well, then, who else have we got? Um, the Grices? Hmm? I don't think they've ever been away from St Mary Mead. The girl, Margot Bentz, who was taking the photographs, had been there at least half an hour, so it doesn't seem likely that she would have come as a surprise to Marina. What about the film people who were there? Well, they're certainly more promising. Ardwick Fenn. He's a very big number in the film industry, had mm. some kind of an affair with Marina at the time she was married to her second husband. Hmm. Quite possible, I should say. Particularly if he was paying her a surprise visit. And then there's a sexy-looking blonde. She's Lola Brewster. Mm. She was once married to Marina's third husband. He got a divorce from her in order to marry Marina. Not a very amicable divorce, either. I put her down as number one. Uh, I'm, I'm not so sure. I mean, think of the difficulties, Frank. How do you mean? She's a famous film star. All the locals would be looking at her. Well, she wouldn't have much of a chance to slip something in Marina's glass without being noticed. That's true enough. I suppose that butler chap, Giuseppe, he, he might have had a chance to do it. He was helping with the drinks when he wasn't announcing the names of the people who were coming in. Uh, there was a woman helping out too. Gladys, somebody or other. Mm. We've got a long way to go. You know, excuse me. Cornish. Yes, he's here, I'll tell him. It's Gossington Hall. Marina Gregg's feeling better and we'd like to see you. Tell them I'm on my way, before she has a chance to change her mind. I've been behaving quite disgracefully, Chief Inspector. I'm ashamed of myself. It was only natural that you should feel upset. Well, everyone was upset. I'd no reason to make out it was worse for me than anyone else. Hadn't you, Miss Gregg? You're very perceptive. Yes, I had. I'm a coward. Somebody wanted to kill me, and I... I didn't want to die. Why do you think someone wanted to kill you? Because it was my glass that had been tampered with. It was just a mistake that poor, stupid woman got it. Besides... Yes, Miss Gregg? Jason says I must tell you all about it. You've confided in him, then? I didn't want to do so at first, and, and then when I did... I found out that he thought so himself all along. You haven't told me why you should think someone might want to kill you. You better look at this. Don't think you'll escape next time. When did you get this? It, it was on my dressing table when I came out of my bath this morning. So someone in the house... Not necessarily. Someone could have climbed onto the balcony outside my window... I think they meant to frighten me still more, but actually it it made me snap out of it. I just felt furiously angry, and I, I sent word to you to come and see me. Is this the first message that you've had? No. No, the first one was left in my dressing room at the studio. Oh. It, it said, prepare to die. Well, I, I thought it was one of those religious cranks who have it in for actresses. I, I just tore it up and threw it into the wastebasket. And subsequently? 
There was one more on the morning of the fate. One of the gardeners brought it in. He'd found it on the sundial. These are your last hours on earth. I didn't think for a minute that it was a genuine threat. And, and have you any idea who might have written these notes? How can I possibly tell? I think you might have quite a good idea, Miss Gregg. I haven't. I assure you, I haven't. You're, you're a very famous person. You've had great successes. Men have fallen in love with you. Women have been jealous and envied you. Surely you must have some idea of who could have written these notes. <clears throat> Jason, darling, the chief inspector is insisting that I must know who wrote those horrid notes. You know I don't. None of us knows. I realise it must seem unbelievable to you, but honestly, neither Marina nor I have any idea about this business. Very well, Mr. Rudd. Uh, there's one more thing I'd like to ask your wife. You remember Mr. and Mrs. Babcock's arrival at the reception? Now, I am told that immediately after greeting them, you looked over Mrs. Babcock's shoulder and saw something which seemed to alarm you. Is that true? And if so, what was it? Of course it isn't true. What could have alarmed me? That's what I want to know. There were people coming up on the staircase. There was a Mr. Grice and his wife who lived in the village for years. There was Ardwick Fenn who's just arrived from the States. And there was Miss Lola Brewster. Was it the sight of one of those people that upset you? I tell you, I wasn't upset. And yet Mrs. Babcock said something to you which you left unanswered because you were staring past her at something else. If you knew anything about acting in the theatre, you would be able to understand quite easily. There comes a point when you know a part well and you go on playing it mechanically, but your mind isn't on it. And quite suddenly, there comes a horrible blank moment when you don't know where you got to in the play or what your next lines are. Well, that's what happened to me at the reception. My mind went blank. And then I realised Mrs. Badcock had been telling me a, a long story that I hadn't heard at all and, and was looking at me in an eager sort of way and that I hadn't answered her. That's all it was. Just... Tiredness. Just tiredness. You insist on that? Yes. I can't see why you don't believe me. Mr Rudd, I think you're more likely to understand me than your wife is. I'm concerned for her safety. The only way we can achieve that is for you to give me all the clues you possibly can. I, I don't say you know who the person is that made the attempt, but I do think you must be able to hazard a guess. If you don't know the truth, will you urge your wife to tell me? Uh, you hear what he says, Marina. If you do know something, then, then don't be foolish about it. If you've the least suspicion of anyone, tell us now. But I haven't. You must believe me. There were two people on the stairs you must have been surprised to see. Mr. Fenn and Miss Brewster. You didn't know they were coming, did you? I had no idea they were even in England. I was delighted. Absolutely delighted. Delighted to see Miss Brewster. Well, of course. Uh, L Lola Brewster was, I believe, um, originally married to your third husband, Robert Truscott. That is so. He divorced her in order to marry you. Oh, everyone knows about that. You needn't think you found out something special. Oh, there was a bit of a rumpus at the time, I'll admit. Did she make threats against you? Well... In a way, yes. But no one takes those sort of threats seriously. It was at a party and she'd had loads to drink and it was years ago. And what about your other visitor, Ardwick Fenn? Oh, he is a very good friend of ours. It was some years since we'd seen him. Was he an old friend of yours too, Miss Gregg? Oh, yes. He was a friend of mine always. If you think I looked up and saw Ardwick and was frightened of him... Oh, that's nonsense. I was just very pleased. It was a delightful surprise. Thank you, Miss Gregg. If you should feel inclined at any time to take me a little further into your confidence, I should strongly advise you to do so. Mr. 
Miss Marple speaking. Jane, this is Dolly. Dolly. I thought I should tell you. That secretary woman, Zielinski, I think she's called, was ringing someone from the public call box in the road, and she went out of her way to explain to me, quite unnecessarily, that she was ringing from there because the line at Gossington Hall was out of order. But I've just rung there, and it isn't. Really? Now that is interesting. For what reason, do you think? Well, clearly she didn't want to be heard. Exactly. It's suspicious, don't you think? I'd certainly like to know what she's up to. Um, um, I'm off to London, Frank. I've, uh, I've got hold of a piece of information that I think might interest Miss Marple, but I want to be sure of my facts first. And I think it's time I had a word with Ardwick Fenn and Lola Brewster. Oh, they're still in London, then? Yes. Yes, they're over here for the summer. I'd be very interested to hear what Lola Brewster has to say for herself. She's still top of my list. But it's all such nonsense. Who on earth would want to kill Marina? She's such a sweetie. Everyone loves her. Including you, Miss Brewster? Oh, I'm devoted to her. Always have been. In spite of that bit of trouble 11 or 12 years ago? Oh, you mean Rob and Marina going off together? Hmm? It was the... Best thing that ever happened to me. I, I already knew that Rob and I couldn't possibly last. And anyway, I was passionately in love with Eddie Groves. And yet, according to what I've heard, you were threatening to shoot her. Oh, but people expect you to say things like that. It keeps the papers happy. Of course, I really wouldn't shoot anyone. In spite of taking a pot shot at Eddie Groves two years later. Oh, that was because we'd had an argument. I lost my temper. I have it on very good authority. In fact, I, I made a note of it. Uh, the bitch needn't think she'll get away with it. If I don't shoot Marina now, I'll get her in some other way. I don't care how long I have to wait, I'll get even in the end. Oh, I'm sure I never said anything of the kind. I'm sure, Miss Brewster, that you did. One says all sorts of things when one's mad at people. But I certainly wouldn't have waited 14 years and then dropped a dose of poison in her cocktail glass within three minutes of meeting her again. I mean, she was delighted to see me. I couldn't possibly have killed her. Do you have any idea who might have wanted to do so? Nobody would have wanted to kill her. She's such a silly woman. Always changing her mind and making a song and dance about everything. Unhappy love affairs, not being able to have children. But she adopted children, didn't she? Mm, it didn't work out. She does these impossible things and then wishes she hadn't. What happened to the children? I've no idea. They just sort of vanished after a bit. She got tired of them, like everything else. Uh, from what I've read in the newspapers, I gather the ideas that uh, Mrs. whatever her name was, was murdered by mistake. That the dose was intended for Marina? That's right, Mr. Finn. I really can't think you would want to poison Marina. After all, Lynette Brown wasn't there. Lynette Brown? Well, if Marina breaks her contract, Lynette gets the part, and that would mean a great deal to her. Still, I don't imagine she'd send an emissary along to drop poison in Marina's cocktail. Much too melodramatic, even for Lynette. It does seem a little far-fetched. <laughs> Tell me, Mr. Fenn, was Marina Gregg very surprised to see you? Uh, she just couldn't believe her eyes when she saw me coming up the stairs. You hadn't seen her for a long time? Uh, for four or five years. There was a time when you and she were very close friends, I believe. Well, it would be well, I think, if you made it clear exactly what you mean by that. It seems to have been a matter of common gossip that you were wildly in love with her. Well, I had a bit of a yen for it one time, yes. Mercifully, these things pass. I gather that she turned you down and that you resented the fact. I wonder where you gathered that from. Confidential magazine? I'm never pleased to be thwarted, and most people... Who do that tend to be sorry afterwards. You used your influence to get her dropped from a picture, I believe. She was unsuitable for the role. Now, there was trouble between her and the director. I had money in that picture, and I had no intention of putting it at risk. She told a friend of hers that she was afraid of you, I believe. Now, that was very childish of her, but then she is childish. You think there was no need for her to be afraid of you? Of course not. I soon got over my little burst of infatuation. I've always gone on the principle that uh, where women are concerned, there are as good fish in the sea as ever came out of it. 
You have a wide knowledge of the world Marina Gregg moves in. Can you suggest anyone likely to have such a grudge against her that they would try to get rid of her? Uh, probably a dozen. That is, if they didn't have to do anything about it personally. If it were just a matter of pressing a button, I'd say there'd be a lot of willing fingers. You were there on the day that Heather Badcock died. Do you think any of the people who were around you might have slipped the poison in Marina Gregg's glass? Yeah, I wouldn't like to say. That means you have some idea. It means I have nothing to say on the subject. I wasn't taking much interest in the people who were there. Why don't you talk to that long-haired girl who was taking all the photographs? She certainly had a good look at everybody. I had my camera just below the top of the stairs so that I could get the guests as they came up and then swing round to take Marina shaking hands with them. So you had a fairly clear view of her from where you were standing? Perfect. Tell me, Miss Spence, did you notice that while she was talking to Mrs. Badcock, she suddenly looked as if she'd been taken ill? Ill? I wouldn't say that. I take it someone must have noticed it. One witness said that she looked startled, another that she had a frozen expression on her face. Frozen? Uh, just a minute. I got the folder out when I heard you were coming. Hmm. What you say certainly rings a bell. Uh, where the hell is it? Why can you never find things when you want them? <laughs> oh, I've got it. Here. She's certainly staring at something. Sometimes it's hard to make up your mind as to whether witnesses are exaggerating or if they're just imagining that they saw something. But that's not true in this case. There was something to see, and she saw it. C can I keep this photograph? Oh, yes. You can keep that print. You didn't send it to the press. I mean, it's rather dramatic. I wouldn't care to do that. If you look into somebody's soul by accident, you feel a bit embarrassed about cashing in. Did you know Marina Gregg at all? No. You come from the States, don't you? I was born in England. I was trained in America, though. I came back here about three years ago. And how old were you when you went out there? Just a kid. I was five. I have an idea that you know Marina Gregg rather better than you say. What do you mean by that? Don't you think it would be better to tell me the truth, Miss Spence? Why don't you admit that Marina Gregg adopted you as a child and that you lived with her for four years? <sighs> you nosy bastard. Yes. Marina Gregg took me to America. <laughs> My mother had eight kids and lived in a slum. She couldn't wait to get me off her hands. Marina Gregg adopted three children, I believe. Yes. One was American and the other came from Czechoslovakia. Oh, we had a wonderful life. Clothes and cars and a wonderful house to live in and people to look after us. And our mama crooning over us and having our picture together in all the film magazines. And this went on till when? Until she got sick of that particular bit of play acting. No, that's not true. Until she found she was going to have a child of her own. Then we weren't wanted anymore. She didn't really care a damn about us. You hate her very much. Why the hell shouldn't I hate her? She did the worst thing anybody can do to another human being. Let us believe we were loved and wanted and then reveal that it was all a sham. And was she surprised to see you when you turned up at the fate? She didn't even recognize me. Oh, I'd done a lot of lobbying to get that job. I lived with her for four years and she didn't even recognize me. You didn't tell her who you were? Of course I didn't tell her. Did you try to poison her? <laughs> what a ridiculous idea. But I suppose it's part of your job. No, I did not. But it wouldn't surprise me if someone has another go at it. Whoever it is, is out for her blood. And I wouldn't shed a tear for her. Have you heard the latest? From Gossington Hall? Well, not exactly. You know... Oh. You know my friend Gladys? The girl who works in the canteen at the film studio? That's the one. Well, apparently, yesterday was Marina Gregg's first day back on the set. And she created something frightful. What about? It seems there was something wrong with her morning coffee. 
She took one sip and said she didn't like the taste of it. She got quite hysterical. And was there? Was there what? Something wrong with it. I've no idea. Mr Rudd took it away from her and poured it down the sink. That was rather rash of him. Do you think it was poisoned? Well, since Mr Rudd saw fit to get rid of it, we shall never know. But I would think it is quite likely. <laughs> Damn them, blast. I knew I should never have come out without my atomizer. <laughs> Signorina Zilinski, where have you been? Mr Rudd has been asking for you. Uh, I had to go down to the village for something. Where are you off to, anyway? <laughs> to the station, to catch the train. My brother Stefano, he works at the Columbadora in Soho. He's very ill. He has the fever, and he wants to see me. Mr. Rudd said I could go. I will be back tonight. But I must go, or I shall not catch the train. Off you go, Giuseppe. I hope your brother's okay. <coughs> oh, who the hell would want to live in the countryside? Ella, I couldn't think where you'd got to. I had to see one of the gardeners. What's the matter? I received an analysis of the coffee that Marina was complaining about. But you poured it down the sink. I saw you. Oh, I'm, I'm pretty good at sleight of hand. I managed to keep some back. And was there something wrong with it? You see for yourself. Arsenic. And I thought she was just being hysterical. I don't know what to do, Alor. I was so certain I'd be able to make sure nothing else happened to her, and now nothing is safe. But Nobody could tamper with anything here in the house. Most people will do anything for money. I, I doubt if I'd trust Giuseppe too far if it came to that. But he's been with us for ages. <laughs> I know, I know. I just... I just don't know where I am anymore. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'd better get my atomizer. I, I think I must have left it in my bedroom. <laughs> Ardwick Fenn speaking. This is Chief Inspector Craddock. And what can I do for you today? I'm very sorry to tell you that Miss Zielinski died this morning of cyanide poisoning. Good God. Was it an accident? Most definitely not. Somebody had put prussic acid in her atomizer. Oh, I see. But why are you ringing me about it? Since I understand that you'd known her for some years, I was wondering whether you could suggest any motive for her death. Well, surely Jason Rudd is the person to talk to about that. We've done so. But there might be a chance that you know something he does not. Are you still there, Mr. Fenn? I'm still here, Chief Inspector. Well, I will tell you something that may be of assistance to you. The facts are these. A couple of days ago, I received a telephone call. A voice spoke to me in a whisper. It said, I saw you put the tablets in the glass... You didn't know there had been an eyewitness, did you? That's all for now. Very soon you would be told what to do. I see. Yeah. Of course, the suggestion is utterly absurd, or I shouldn't be telling you all this. But it would seem that Miss Zielinski was embarking on a little blackmail. You recognized her voice? Well, it's difficult to recognize a whisper, but uh, she sneezed before ringing off. And Ella Zielinski suffered from hay fever. I think that she got hold of the wrong person at her first attempt. It seems possible that eventually she got round to the right person. Blackmail can be a very dangerous game. It's too dreadful. Something has happened. I really don't like to tell you about it, dear. I really don't. It might be a shock to you. If you don't tell me, somebody will. Someone else has been killed, is that it? Oh, that's very sharp of you, dear. Mm. I don't know what should put such an idea into your head. As a matter of fact, I was expecting it. Were you really? Somebody always sees something. Only sometimes it takes a little while for them to realise what it is they've seen. Uh, who is it that's dead? The Italian butler. He was shot last night. Though goodness knows why anybody should want to murder a person like that. I expect that he was trying to blackmail somebody. He went to London yesterday, they say. Well, that's very suggestive, too, I think. But that's not where he was killed. Someone shot him in his own rooms just after he got back to Gossington Hall. Oh, but I mustn't waste time gossiping. I'm neglecting you. You haven't had your elevenses. And, Cherry, not so much noise. You don't want to disturb Miss Marple, do you? Cherry, could you come here for a moment? See what I mean? 
I'm sorry, Miss Markle. I didn't mean to disturb you. Come in and close the door. Oh. I called you because I want to talk to you. Have you heard that the butler at Gossington Hall was shot dead last night? What? Giuseppe? Yes, I believe that was his name. Oh, I didn't know about that. I wonder if Gladys got to see him or not. Why should Gladys want to see him? There was something that struck her as a bit funny and she was going to ask him what he thought about what it. What do you mean, a bit funny? She was helping out with the drinks on the day of the fete. Yes. And there was something she saw that struck her as a bit funny. What did she see? To be honest, I thought what she told me was just nonsense. What was it? She was talking about Mrs Badcock and the cocktail business and she said she was quite near her at the time. And she said she did it herself. Did what herself? Spilt her cocktail down her dress and ruined it. Oh, you mean it was clumsiness? No, no, not clumsiness. Gladys said that she did it on purpose, that she meant to do it. Well, that doesn't make sense, does it? Whatever way you look at it, it was a new dress too. No, I can't see any sense in that. I don't think there was anything to ask Giuseppe about, do you? No, I don't. <laughs> but it's always interesting when one doesn't see... If you don't see what it means, you must be looking at it the wrong way round, which is probably the case here. Why should she deliberately spill the cocktail over her own dress? <laughs> but if Gladys wanted to talk to Giuseppe about it, there's one thing that's certain. It had something to do with the murder attempt on Marina Gregg. You've got to help me, Jason. I'm so terribly frightened. The killer is getting closer to me every minute. Three murders. I was almost certain that it was Ella, but now... Oh, what on earth made you think it was Ella? Because she hated me. Don't men ever see these things? She was madly in love with you. But it can't be Ella, because Ella's dead. Oh, you've got to get me away from this hateful house, Jason. Get me somewhere I can be safe. Darling, will running away do any good? Of course it will. We'll get away. Away from this person who hates me. If there's anyone who hates you that much, it wouldn't be difficult to follow you. You mean I shall never get away? I shall never be safe again? Oh, it will be all right. I'll look after you. I'll keep you safe. Give me my pills. The yellow ones. I must have something to calm me. Here. I don't take too many, for God's sakes. Don't worry. Sometimes they don't have any effect anymore. You will take care of me, won't you? Swear you'll take care of me. Always. To the bitter end. You look so odd when you said that. Odd? Uh -huh. Like what? Like a clown. Laughing at something terribly sad that no one else has seen. Stay with me. Two murders within 24 hours. Not a very distinguished performance on my part. There are the times when I think I should have taken up market gardening. What you need is a good stiff whiskey and soda. Well, I won't say no. And what is more, I shall get it for you myself. We don't want Miss Knight fussing about in here. You are full of surprises. I've no idea what you kept in your corner cupboard. Are you sure you're not a secret drinker, Aunt Jane? I have never been an advocate of teetotalism. <laughs> a bottle of whiskey is always advisable to keep on the premises in case of a shock or an accident. Is that enough? Exactly right. You never fail to astonish me. Now, tell me all about it. Well, I, I think I rather want you to tell me. You know as much about it as I do. There's something I just don't seem to be able to get to grips with. What am I missing? Who am I looking for? Is this one of those cases where it's the most unlikely person to have committed the crime? Oh, well, no, I don't think so. I have said over and over again, not only to you, my dear Dermot, that it is always the most obvious person who commits the crime. One thinks so often of the wife or husband, and very often it is the wife or husband. Meaning Jason Rudd. But he adores Marina Gregg. So it would appear. But that might be very clever acting. Acting. That's just the point. 
I have to admit I feel rather out of my depth in this film world. All these scandals and divorces, it must be difficult for you too. Oh, I don't find it all that difficult. Human nature is just the same everywhere. One comes back, I think, to the question of who could have wanted to kill Marina Gregg? To want to kill her so much as to make a second attempt to do so. And to kill the secretary and the Italian butler into the bargain. I understand that the butler went to London on the day of his death. Hmm? Does anyone know what he did there? Well, if you're allowed to tell me, that is. <laughs> None of his relatives saw him, so the story about his brother being dangerously ill is obviously a lie. We have no knowledge of what he was doing until a quarter to two when he visited his bank and made a deposit of £500 in cash. £500? Hmm. Quite an interesting sum. Hmm? I should imagine it would be the first instalment of a good many others, wouldn't you? It rather looks that way. And we have in London Ardwick Fenn, Lola Brewster and Margot Benz. All three were present at the reception, and all three could have met Giuseppe at a prearranged rendezvous somewhere in London. Oh, by the way, there's something I have to tell you. Oh, yes. What is that? Your hunch was right. Margot Benz was one of the children that Marina Gregg adopted. Margot Benz. I was certain that it had something to do with children. Even so, I can't believe that after all these years... I know, I know, one never can... But think back to your own childhood. Can't you remember some incident, some happening that caused you grief, or a passion quite incommensurate to its real importance? Hmm. Odd you should say that. When my mother died, I was having dinner in the nursery. My favourite, jam roll pudding. And one of the servants came and told my governess that my mother had been killed in an accident. Now, whenever I see a portion of jam roll pudding in a shop or a restaurant, a great wave of horror and despair comes over me. I don't know, it sounds silly, but... No, it isn't silly at all. It's given me a sort of idea. But I want you to tell me, if you have notes of it, exactly what Heather Badcock said to Marina Gregg at the reception. I know the gist of it. It is the actual words I need. Hmm. Let me see. Um, we've got accounts from your friend Mrs. Bantry, from Jason Rudd and Mr. Badcock. They vary a little. Exactly. It's the variations I want. Well, according to Mrs. Bantry, she said something like, I can't tell you how wonderful this is for me. You won't remember, but years ago in Bermuda, I got up from bed when I had chicken box and came along to see you, and you gave me your autograph. It was one of the proudest days of my life. I see. She mentioned the place and not the date. Hmm. And Mr. Rudd? Um, he said that Mrs. Badcock told his wife that she'd got up from bed when she had the flu and had come to meet Marina, and she'd given her her autograph. No time or place? No. And Mr. Badcock? Oh, he was rather vague about it all. She told him that when she was ill as a girl, she'd managed to get up and go to meet Miss Gregg. He didn't go into any particulars. It was evidently in the days before he met her. I see. What do you see? Not as much as I'd like to yet, but I am thankful that girl is safe in Bournemouth. That girl? What girl? Gladys, the girl who works in the canteen at the film studios. How do you know she's in Bournemouth? Because I sent her there. I gave her some money and told her to take a holiday, but not to tell anybody where she had gone. Why on earth did you do that? Because I didn't want her to get killed, of course. You're quite sure you don't want another lovely cup of tea, dear? Quite sure, thank you. I've had such a sweet letter from Lady Conway. You remember my telling you about her? Her memory's getting bad. Can't remember her relatives sometimes and tells them to go away. Very shrewd of her, I should have thought. Now, now, we mustn't be naughty. She's going to spend the next six months at the Belgrave in Landidno and is most anxious for me to join her there. But, uh... Please, if you are wanted, if she needs you there, and you would like to go... No, no, I couldn't possibly do that. What would your nephew say? Oh, don't you worry about Raymond. I'll take care of him. I am not going to stand in your way. You write to Lady Conway and tell her you'll go. And could you send Cherry in to see me, please? Well, if you're really sure... Yes, I'm quite certain. And pass me the telephone, could you? Thank you, Miss Marple. 
Lady Conway will be so pleased. Good morning, Vicar. This is Miss Marple. Ah, Miss Marple. Yes, I wonder if you could help me on a small point. Certainly. You were at the reception at Gossington Hall the other day, I believe? Ah, yes, I was. And Miss Gregg was most charming. She said she would make a contribution to the roof fund. I believe you were standing quite near when Mrs. Badcock was introduced to her. Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, Mrs. Badcock told her a long story about meeting her in Bermuda and how she'd got out of her sick bed. And did Mrs. Badcock mention the illness that she was suffering from? Oh, yes. Uh, she said it was measles. Uh, at least not uh, real measles. Uh, much less serious. Uh, German measles. I remember my cousin Cornelius... Thank you so much, Vicar. Yes, Miss Marple? I want you to get Inch. I want him to come round as soon as possible. Oh, yes, of course. Shall I say where? Tell him I want to go to Gossington Hall. Yes, Miss Marple. I, uh, I think you were mentioning the other day that you were thinking of leaving the development. That's right. It's that Mrs Hartnell next door. She complains about the slightest noise. Well, Cherry, how would you like to come and live here? You and your husband could move into the rooms over the old stables. Oh, well, that would be just marvellous. But what about Miss Knight? Miss Knight will be leaving shortly. Oh, Jim would just love it. There'd be such a lot of room and he'd be able to... But I'm forgetting... I haven't told you the news. What news? About Mr Badcock. What has happened to him? He's been taken off to the police station. I think he's going to be charged with murder. Miss Marple? Yes, I am Miss Marple. I'm Dr Gilchrist. I believe you wish to see Mr Rudd? It is necessary that I should. I'm afraid that's just not possible. Then I shall stay here until it is possible. I'm afraid you don't understand, Miss Marple. Marina Gregg died last night in her sleep. Died? How? An overdose of her sleeping medicine. Was it an accident? Well, that is definitely my view. But it could be suicide? It could, but that is most unlikely. Or someone could have given it to her. A most remote contingency. And a thing like that would be quite impossible to prove. I'm sorry, Dr Gilchrist, but it is now more imperative than ever that I should see Mr Rudd. There is something I have to tell him. I'll see what I can do. I understand that you insist on seeing me, Miss Marple. What is it that can be so important? I am sorry about your wife's death. I must ask you to believe that I should not intrude upon you unless it was absolutely necessary. I wish to prevent an injustice being done to an innocent man. An innocent man? Arthur Badcock. He's being questioned by the police now. Well, questioned in connection with my wife's death? But that's absurd. He didn't even know her. Oh, yes, Mr Rudd. He knew her. He was married to her. Arthur Badcock? You, you, you sure you haven't... He was married to your wife when she was very young, before she went into pictures. My wife was first married to an Alfred Beadle. He was in real estate. And he changed his name to Arthur Badcock. He's still in real estate. He could never really have kept up with Marina Gregg. So, what do you want me to do for you, Miss Marple? I want, if I may... To stand on the spot where you and your wife receive the guests on the day of the fate. If that is not too much trouble. My wife stood just here. People came up the stairs. She shook hands with them and passed them on to me. She was facing that picture. Giacomo Bellini's laughing Madonna. A painting of a happy mother with her child. I understand now. The whole thing is really quite simple, isn't it? Simple? I, I don't think I understand you. Oh, that will be Chief Inspector Craddock. Perhaps it would be as well if he joined us.
Miss Marple was talking, Chief Inspector, of the day when Mrs. Badcock was murdered. I think you should carry on, Miss Marple. I was saying that it is all really quite simple. My friend Mrs. Bantry quoted some lines from a poem by Tennyson. The mirror cracked from side to side. The curse is come upon me, cried the Lady of Shalott. She saw this frozen look come over your wife's face. Haven't we been over this a great many times? Yes, but we will have to go over it once more. The reason for that expression was because your wife was looking not at Heather Badcock, but at the picture of a happy mother holding up a happy child. The moment Heather Badcock began her story about that meeting in Bermuda, she was doomed. The curse had fallen upon her. Could you make yourself a little clearer? Of course. The difficulty was that nobody told you what Heather Badcock actually said. But they did. I read it all out to you. But no one told you the most important fact. Heather Badcock was suffering from German measles. What on earth has that got to do with it? It's not a very serious illness, really, but it is extremely infectious. And there's one thing you have to remember. If a woman contracts it in the first weeks of pregnancy, there is a chance that it may have a very serious effect. It can cause a child to be born blind or mentally defective. And that, I believe, is what happened to your wife's child, Mr. Rudd. That's quite true. Marina told me that she developed German measles early on in her pregnancy. She never knew how or, or from whom she caught the disease. And then a perfectly strange woman came up the stairs and told her with an air of being quite proud of what she'd done. I think, Mr. Rudd, that you understood quite well what that moment meant to Marina Gregg. Oh, yes. I understood. It was too much for her. Here was this woman who had ruined her happiness and destroyed the sanity and health of her child. She wanted to punish her, to take her life. And unfortunately, the means were ready to hand. The Carmo. She was carrying it with her. It was very easy to do. She put the stuff into her own glass. She put the glass down on the table and presently she managed to jog Heather Badcock's arm so that her drink was spilt down her new dress. But I thought you said it was Heather Badcock. That is what I understood from what Cherry said. But when Gladys told her that she did it on purpose, she didn't mean Heather Badcock. She meant Marina Gregg. Of course. It's so obvious when you think about it. I imagine, Mr Rudd, that your wife did not realise the seriousness of what she'd done and certainly not the risk she was running until afterwards. But when she did realise it, she was horribly afraid. Afraid that someone had noticed her. She could see only one way out. To make it appear that she was the intended victim. She did fantastic things. She wrote threatening letters to herself. She put arsenic in her own coffee. But there was one person who could see through it all. This is only a theory of yours. You may put it like that if you wish. But you know quite well, don't you, that I am speaking the truth. You knew from the first, when you heard the mention of German measles. You knew, and you were frantic to protect her. But you didn't realise how much you would have to protect her from. You didn't realise that there would be other deaths. Ella Zelensky, who was just wildly guessing. Giuseppe, who was trying his hand at blackmail. You were frantic to prevent her from doing more harm. I'm very sorry for you. You cared for her very much, didn't you? That, I believe, is common knowledge. And you know, don't you, Chief Inspector, that poor Arthur Badcock had nothing at all to do with it. He came to the fate because he wanted to catch a glimpse of the girl he had married long ago. She didn't even recognize him. At least, well, she said nothing to me. We didn't really suspect him. But after we found out, and after Miss Gregg's death, naturally, we had to have him in for questioning. Uh, you, uh, you don't have to worry about him, though, Miss Marple. Would you allow me to see her, Mr Rudd? Uh, yes. You can see her. 
You seem to understand her very well. She was a great actress, and a beautiful and very unhappy woman. Death was really the only way of escape left open to her. It is very fortunate for her that she happened to take an overdose, or was given it. She was so lovely, and she had suffered so much. He said, "She has a lovely face. God, in His mercy, lend her grace." The Lady of Shalott. In Agatha Christie's *The Mirror Cracked from Side to Side*, Miss Marple was played by June Whitfield. Chief Inspector Craddock, Ian Lavender. Marina Gregg, Gail Honeycutt. Jason Rudd, James Lawrenson. Dolly Bantry, Pauline Jamieson. Miss Knight, Susie Aitchison. Cherry, Jane Whittenshaw. Heather Badcock, Jilly Bond. Arthur Badcock, David Timpson. Lola Brewster, Joanna Munro, Ardwick Fenn, Nigel Anthony, Ella Zielinski, Liz Golding, Dr. Gilchrist, John Hartley, Margot Bence, Sarah Jane Home, Giuseppe Saverio Deodato, Inspector Cornish, David Antrobus. Other parts were played by members of the cast.